Welcome, everyone. I'm Patricia Kranz, Executive Director of the Overseas Press Club of America. We are delighted tonight to have a new installment in our How I Did It series with Renata Brito and Felipe Dana of the Associated Press, who won the OPC's Kim Wall Award this year for their series, Adrift. Uh, talking to them tonight will be their editor, Mary Rajkumar, Global Investigations Editor of the AP and an OPC Governor. Mary has led two other international investigations for AP that won the Pulitzer Prize and also OPC awards for Erasing Mariupol and Seafood for Slaves. Her AP information says she edited stories that won 10 OPC awards overall, not including a drift. Well done, Mary. So the panel will talk for about 30 minutes and then open it for questions. Feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time. And um, this program is being recorded and we will post it on our YouTube channel. So I now hand it over to Mary. Hi everyone, thanks for listening. So let me start with the disclosure, which is I was an editor on this project, not the editor. The editor was Ted Anthony and he should get credit. So credit to Ted. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Felipe and Renata, two of our favorite people at the AP. Um, Renata just won a Livingston Award this year. And uh, Adrift has won a series of other awards, including a Webby and, as Patty noted, an OPC Award and a World Press Photo Award. And Felipe was part of the team that won a 2023 Pulitzer Prize for the breaking news photography in Ukraine. He was also a Pulitzer finalist in 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2021. So I should mention that they are married. They are obviously a power couple. And the subhead of this session will be how I did it without killing my spouse. So, um, I, um, so let's dive straight into it. Um, how did you two get interested in this story? How did you find out about it? Why did you think there was more to it? Can you jump into it? Hi, yes. Uh, thanks, Mary, for the introduction. And Patricia, and thanks for having us uh, to talk about Adrift. So it really started with a phone call from one of my sources who noticed this local news story out of Trinidad and Tobago of a boat that appeared, uh, a strange boat that appeared full of dead bodies. And um, I cover migration uh, and I'm based in Spain. And so my source as well as a migration export expert, we both looked at this boat and we immediately recognized it as the same type of boat that migrants use to migrate from West Africa to Spain, specifically from Mauritania to Spain. So when we saw this boat in Tobago on this local news story, we were both shocked, uh, as were other people who had noticed this news, because it meant that it was likely uh, that migrants had gotten lost in the Atlantic, as we knew that, you know, it happens so often, but we hadn't seen, or at least, you know, there was very little precedent for boats drifting all the way across the Atlantic, even though there were no, no survivors. And so it just immediately shocked me and, and it made me uh, wonder if this boat drifted across the Atlantic, how many others are, are lost or s sank or are missing? And um, I think it it just rang alarm bells in my head that some, we need to look into this. And Renata, you were saying that a source of yours had previously said, previously predicted really, that there was going to be more traffic on the more dangerous Atlantic route because of closures on the Mediterranean. So one of the things that I think we really wanted to emphasize in the story, it isn't just a story about this one boat. It's a story of accountability, about the EU's policies and what has led to hundreds of people anonymously dying. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Right. So obviously, um, the reasons why people migrate and the reasons why certain routes uh, see more traffic is complex, and there's multiple reasons. But one of them was um, heightened surveillance in the Mediterranean uh, that led people to look into alternatives and smugglers to look into alternatives. And this Atlantic uh, route, we call it the Atlantic route from West Africa to the Canary Islands, which is a European Union territory near the west coast of Africa, um, reopened, let's say, uh, in 2020, 2021 specifically. And we saw a huge increase in people taking this much more dangerous uh, sea route to Europe. And one of the reasons was because it was getting so much harder to cross the Mediterranean. Um, and yes, as you noticed, as you pointed out, uh, another source of mine had warned that, you know, um, these heightened surve surveillance border closures usually lead to people taking more dangerous Find more dangerous routes. <laughs> Just finding another way, basically. To do. So uh, just because I'm a stickler for detail, how did you know that where the bolts came from? Was it their color? Was it their shape? I mean, like, what? what how, how do you tell something like that? Uh, I uh, yeah, I think we, once you cover you know, migration, especially in this region, each country has a very specific type of boat that they use. And uh -huh. they're very unique and, and colorful in different ways. So it's very easy to identify the ones from Mauritania, for example, as they are white outside and blue inside. Uh, the oh. ones from uh, Senegal, they're more colorful with, uh, you know, very specific uh, as well. And the ones from Morocco, uh, they also have a different shape. So you kind of know uh, if you cover migration in Spain, uh, the arrivals in Spain, especially in the Canary Islands, you kind of can identify where they came from because of the boats being used. And and specifically the ones from Mauritania, they're very, very typical and unique to the region. So uh, it, it was quite easy. That's to how you could tell. Yeah. yeah. So as I know very well, this was a project full of challenges. So can you yes. name some of them and tell us how you got past them? I mean, my quick list just in my head is the fact that it spanned several countries and several languages. The fact that the bureaucracy involved here was such that no officials had actually tried to do this. The fact that you did this in the middle of the 2021 pandemic. Um, do you guys want to talk a little bit about the challenges? Right. I think um, first, the, the, the biggest challenges was just a lack of information that there is on this migration route in the Atlantic uh, from the West Coast of Africa to the Canary Islands. There is very little information. So, um, you know, there's very little statistics, very little reports, monitoring, uh, monitoring. So you really, really have to uh, find uh, people on the ground, local communities uh, that are willing to talk to you. And even then, you know, they might not have that much information. It's very opaque. So that was the first challenge. And also, as you noticed, um, the boat was found in Tobago. The people came from Mar Mauritania and Mali. They were trying to get to Spain. That just a lot of geo very long distances, geography, and um, especially in the beginning when we weren't able to travel there, it was very challenging. And then once we were able to go there, um, we found other challenges on the field. And yeah. I can let Felipe talk yeah. about Mauritania, his favorite place to report. <laughs> Mauritania, yeah. Well, as Serrano just said, it just difficult just because the amount of countries and, and really continents involved in one story. Um, and Mauritania specifically is a very challenging place to work. Uh, and we really had to investigate a lot in Mauritania and that was extremely challenging. We had every issue they can imagine <laughs> to, to report on the ground there. Um, so that that was also yeah they don't like to talk about migration migration is not something you should be asking about um cameras are you know in theory it's it's a democracy and it's it's open to the press in practice it's not and you have police checkpoints everywhere and people don't yeah. want you asking questions yeah they're really not open to to journalists uh doing any stories that that is not in their interest and and migration is one of them 
every official response that we got from them was that they don't have this issue and there are no oh, when we when we didn't get if we, if, we, if we got actually. yeah yeah actually okay. those were those were after we published even for other uh yeah so basically they don't didn't acknowledge get... any so issue. what felipe is diplomatically avoiding saying is that the two of them wasn't it in mauritania that you were thrown into police custody no and... that was actually in cape Verde. that was another oh well there we go that and, was the second uh, part of the we story to avoid police in mauritania we were we were you know well be well, very discreet well not really avoid barely but we well we made it to escape well, prison but uh... one thing I love about that is that you had very different approaches in terms of what was the best way to get out of prison in Cape Verde. So, yeah. do you want to talk a little we, bit? We about weren't that? in prison, we were at the police station. Just to be fair, we were asked to follow police officers because we were reporting and trying to talk to survivors. And, anyways, long story short, uh, we ended up in a police station. Felipe was um, very. Uh, <laughs> agitated in explaining the you know right the, the, no, the, the, the illegality of the what they were doing trying to take our cameras away yeah. while i was calling uh the ambassadors of our respective countries to see if they could help us and we still argue about which tactic worked best but in the end we were we managed to to be released and, and continue our reporting yeah yeah but that was as i said that was in, in uh and the, that was in Cape Verde. In, in the second part of a drift yeah, uh, in 36, 36 days. days yeah. And but uh, uh during a drift on the in Mauritania, we, we had challenges with just uh everything you can imagine. Access access, the, the fixers, the translators, the drivers were afraid when they realized we were reporting on migration, they didn't really want to uh, work with us. So it was really it was really difficult to work and um also, culturally, uh, at the beginning, we, we had issues with access in the villages. Once they figured out what we were doing and the story came out, it was the opposite. They were they wanted more, uh, but you know it was really challenging in the beginning to to really convince that we we're just trying to yeah to explain what yeah. we were doing, what we were trying to find out, and 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 when people understood that actually. You know, we want to find out who the victims are in this tragedy and find their families. Everyone was very, most people were helpful, let's say. Yeah. That's actually one thing that I would love to go into a bit more because I think one of the hardest parts of this project was actually talking to families, since in most cases, you were the first people to give them any clue about what had happened to their loved ones, or even the fact that their loved ones were on this boat. Um, that's really difficult news to break to anyone when you're the person doing it. And I know that you two spent a lot of time figuring out how to handle it and deciding that it was most important to be a human being first rather than mm -hmm. a journalist. Yeah, so I think. Can you we're, talk about that? Yeah, we were talking. We were saying about other things, but this is probably the most challenging uh, part of the entire project, and um, we debated a lot about this, how to approach. Um, yeah, because we were in this odd situation, as you said, where we had more information to share uh, with families because authorities and others who might. Who should have done this this work had not done this work had not they had no information from anyone about we're, what we're the happened. only ones of any information so actually yeah. we are bringing this really tragic news uh while also reporting on on the story and so we really wanted to separate both uh at, on the one side approaching families explaining to them what we knew and then giving them time and space to process that information and and seeing later if they're still willing to talk to us for the story because yeah. obviously you know we're basically uh telling them that their children likely died on this boat um, yeah 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 because basically what was happening in Mauritania was we we're meeting the families for the first time and uh as another said we we're telling them you know, your, your what happened, 
Yeah. Well, talk a little bit more. One thing you two have said is because of that, the first time you met the families, you didn't record anything and you didn't report anything, even if it meant missing that first reaction. Can you talk a little bit more? Why did you make that decision? Did you feel like you lost anything by making that decision? Talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I think we just didn't feel comfortable to just arrive uh, and immediately start recording and photographing and reporting um, before uh, giving them a chance to process the information. Uh, and, and so that it didn't feel like we were also pressuring them to participate in our reporting because we were we had this news that was so important for them. Although heartbreaking, it is important news because families want to know what happened, even if it's the death uh, of their loved ones, they'd rather know than not know. And so we yeah. did miss, we did miss. Yeah, I think what we have to understand is in many of those places, we we're going to remote villages where there was no phone reception, sometimes no electricity, uh, really very little resources. And we we're meeting all of these uh, family members that usually were gathering around us for the first time. And we realized that it did not feel right to start recording that encounter as they were just at first curious and interested in, in understanding what we were going to tell them about their missing relatives and then you know record the moment that we're telling them it's by all the evidence that we gathered uh it's more it's very likely that you're you know the your person the so person what did you do so, did you tell them that you'd like to come back and talk about it tomorrow did you invite was that yeah. what you did okay we, we both we both discussed this we discussed this a lot and then we agreed that let's separate into That's parts what you would do. we're going to meet everyone first like every because there are oh. various situations like i just described we we, just, we agreed that we're going to meet them first we're going to tell them what we're doing the information and that then, we have and then whoever agrees to participate you would that, Interview then we would go back yeah and, yeah. And well, yeah right because remember we're also um uh, you know initially we didn't have all the information right we have preliminary yeah. evidence that's pointing to uh what might you know the happen. death but we're not we don't have a death certificate we don't have a, a yeah. body we don't have like a hundred percent certain so at that point so was... we also have to be careful about how we deliver this news yeah. In one, um, in one case, which I thought was really interesting, in a sense, you missed the first reaction because of how you decided to do it, which was the mothers, right? The mothers crying and the mothers, and you couldn't get that heartbreaking as it was. You couldn't get that on camera. And then when you guys wanted to go back, it was the men who talked to you and who wouldn't let the women talk to you. Can you talk about that? I mean, yeah, I think I think um, uh, when we started, you know, uh, visiting and and talking to the mothers at first, I imagine that there was a lot of pressure from the mothers on the fathers and the other men to, uh, you know, they were being uh, sometimes fooled by by smugglers and others who who were trying to dismiss uh, their concerns and say, no, your your sons are are not you know, have not been able to communicate because they're in prison. They're alive, but they're in prison or they're alive, but they're, you know, uh, trying to deny that they were dead in this voyage. And so I think, um, I think when in some cases we were asked not to talk to the women again, I think it was about the men trying to control uh, the narrative. Yeah. And also in, in some cases, potentially trying to protect the mothers from, you know, all the heartbreak that that comes with uh, no, the would be. in other cases we were welcomed back and and people wanted to talk to us and wanted to to tell their stories and tell their uh and then, yeah. so yeah so what happened so it was yeah. a 
you know, I'd love to get a little bit more into the actual investigative techniques that you guys had to use because you really had to use a number of them. In particular, can you talk about the one survivor you got to who told you what it was like on the boats and how you got the DNA? How did you actually trace the victims? Um, so there's a few things there. Um, the, the survivor from another shipwreck of similar but another boat was very important for us to understand what the voyage was like because there were no survivors in the boat that we were investigating the boat that arrived in Tobago but this this young man had survived a terrible terrible voyage that was very similar the and same route. the same route left Mauritania but was by chance found by Spain but he was only one of three survivors and there were 63 people on his boat. And so he really gave us a sense of what it's like to be adrift and what happens and day by day and how people start dying progressively and how you survive or how you don't survive. So that was really important for us to understand what the people we were trying to identify and tell their stories might have gone through. Um, so that was one important element. The other um, really crucial element was a list of phone numbers that uh, authorities in Tobago had managed to extract from one of the cell phones recovered from the boat. Um, and for, for various reasons, no one had actually tried calling these numbers and they got to our hands and we decided we should call these numbers and see you know who answers and see if they're looking for anyone that's missing yeah these together yeah these these were these were contactless so they didn't have the number of the phone but they had the basically the contact list so we, what we did was Hanata literally called one by one and, and started across the information that she could get um and then so explaining you know yeah. we found your number in a phone on a boat do you know anyone that's disappeared and then all these names would, names would come up and um and they would match and so we we in the end um kind of had an idea of who the phone belonged to and who had traveled and, with that and where where they were from where they were from yeah. and then we tr and then we went there to talk to the people that we found uh by calling these numbers and and really putting the puzzle together but then of course um, nothing is really certain until you actually do a DNA test on one of the the deceased. And that's uh, and that's when we got yeah. to Tobago, which that's so all of this was still before we got to Tobago. When we got to Tobago, we were very lucky that the a police officer had still kept the evidence that they found in the boat. Um, some by some miracle, it was still there. So we were we basically opened every single evidence bag that was closed for six almost six months at that time, and we photographed every item. Um, you know, um, yeah, basically clothing, yeah, basically. clothing, basically cat uh, clothing and phones and chargers, cataloging basically every item, and then we shared that evidence uh, with the families to see if they could recognize some of those items. And that is how we initially uh, found a, a, a shirt. A few, a few well, shirts. a few shirts actually, yeah. But we could we could cross reference. So then we, yeah. you know, so then we said, okay, so if this shirt belongs to this person and was found on this body, this body is likely to be yeah of that person. But only a DNA test can really confirm that. And so, um, you know, it's not something <laughs> journalists usually do DNA tests. And I remember uh, when, when when an editor, Marjorie, uh, suggested we do it, I thought she was, you know, what is she talking about? But she was so <laughs> right, because that was really uh, essential to having the certainty and, and bringing closure to at least one family. Um, yeah, but basically yeah. at this point, we already had a list of possible uh, people that board the boat and by matching at least one DNA, we were sure that that list, like that the people in our list were in fact the ones in the boat. So it was more than just one person. It was right. really it was a confirmation confirming of- Confirming the group. Yeah, yeah, the group 
could that boat basically belong to that group and um so it was a lot of a lot of pieces from from different uh mm. yeah different you know, areas just yeah. to clarify so no authorities had done a dna test before because they didn't know who to match the dna to right yeah well so it, it's it's a bit more complicated than that because if you think about it you have families scattered between mali senegal france um and you need like uh parents you need like father mother it's not it's not as simple as just you know anyone that's related to the person uh and then you have to compare it, c- compare it with the dna test of the body and so the type all of this test is very also has to be the same yeah. type of test so all this is very bureaucratic and and difficult to get it's not there's you know in mali it's it's not everyone that has access to a lab it's expensive and um, one of the organizations that offers the services normally is the ICRC, but even they uh, aren't available to a lot of families or the families struggle to, to get them to help at first. So then we did, the, we did it through a private lab, but it, everything had to align for it to happen. Like this mother who was originally from Mali happened to be in Senegal where there was a lab that we could you know, higher and that could send a sample to Tobago. It took like months for it to get there and chain of custody and all these things. Uh, and another few months for the authorities in Tobago to compare the DNA and, and you know, say whether it was a match or not. So really, really not as simple as it sounds. But, and until today, that remains the only uh, one that was that was buried and yeah uh, and identified. Oh, so the others still have not been identified. Didn't, there, didn't despite isn't that in the, process? The ICRC, after our investigation, did uh, take more samples from families on our list and sent it to authorities in Tobago, um, and there were matches. Uh, so six, I think, six more bodies were identified oh. for some reason. They were not officially buried or identified um families weren't given a death certificate um and mm-hmm. again it comes down to bureaucracy to uh you know very uh bureaucratic cross- procedures cross borders it's not as simple as it sounds talk a little bit about your source in france meso um how did you find her and how did she end up being related to the boat um it was so meso was an aunt who was looking for her nephew and had posted um on a social media page for missing migrants and i i found her through this social media page and this activist um and she was one of the first uh, families that i interviewed in the sense of people looking for their loved ones in this migration route i didn't know at the time that her nephew would, it would turn out that her nephew, the nephew she was looking for was on the boat that I was investigating. But I didn't know that uh, initially when I first reached out to her, neither did she. Um, And by coincidence, um, we later figure out that her nephew had been traveling with the group from Mauritania, her nephew from Mali had joined the group from Mauritania and had boarded the same boat. And he, they were the ones that uh, we we managed to send a DNA sample of his mother uh, to the authorities in Tobago, and he was the one that we managed to identify and bury. Um, so she was super important, super helpful throughout the entire investigation. Um, very uh, cooperative, very eager to find out what had happened to her nephew, and and extremely helpful. And I'm very thankful for her. Um, uh, agreeing to take part in this story um and yeah yeah and especially at, at the beginning as as we said we were not sure of many things and and a lot of people were skeptical after especially after the first dna tests everything everything changed people realized mm-hmm. i think also many didn't want to accept they wanted to know yeah. you know it, it's one thing to want yeah. to know the thing is to accept but once it they did. Once there was a, a confirmation, things changed and everyone was actually calling Renata every day, basically asking for DNA tests and seeing if we could do 
uh, more uh, DNA tests and and so on. So they they want so but 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 she was really cooperative from the beginning and really trusted us. Uh, so it was really important. Did so talk a little bit. One of the characteristics of this project is that you really tried to weave the text, the photos, the video in seamlessly, and that this was really part of the vision from the start. Um, how did it change your approach? And um, a nod here to our digital storytelling team at the time, Raghu Bararevu and uh, Nat Kasinada and uh, Linda Gorman, who were immensely helpful in working to achieve this mission. So what did that mean? How did that change how you reported? Well, first, we, when we realized that we we're going to work on this together, we, we agreed that uh, I was going to follow Renata at every step of the way, no matter how bad it sounded for photos or video. Um, we we're really going to focus on trying to gather as much visual material as possible because, you know, now it's it's easy to look at the story when it's done. But if you think about the initial initial uh, pitch of a story like this, it's really it's, it's a really difficult story to illustrate because there are no survivors. There's no one left at this stage. We didn't know if we we're going to find any family members or anything at all to show. So it was it was extremely challenging. And I spoke to uh, my photo writer at the time, which was Enrique Marti, and and we kind of agreed that I'm just going to stick with Hanata all the way, follow whatever she's she's uh, she's going to try to find, and. If nothing else, we'll illustrate in a very poetic way. So I had some ideas to shoot abandoned boats along the way. I even did that. To, uh, I started doing that in Mauritania. But then, as we uh, started to to get more evidence and and be able to follow the route that they were basically follow, retrace, retrace, it. yeah, retrace. Yes, retrace. It we we, okay. we just began to um, record and 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 photograph every step of the way, and what we didn't know, but it, the photos really became part of the investigation and an essential part mm -hmm. of the investigation. Right, so the it, photos of the evidence yeah. also and and video. So the photos became an investigative technique in and of themselves because yeah. that's what you showed people. Yeah, so it wasn't just an illustration; it was really part exactly. of the. Exactly, it really became became a visual investigation um yeah and, yeah and and also you know i think when we when we said we sent back um photos of the evidence to the families we did that but we also analyzed photos of the disappeared and found clothing on some of those photos so we identified that they were wearing the same clothes actually in in one of the uh, some of the photos that, that the families had shared with us they were wearing the same clothes that we found in tobago so uh, in some cases we didn't even need the families to recognize it because it was there on the photo uh, that they had shared with yeah. us yeah then and then of course as you said when we realized that well, from the beginning we were already talking to ragu and others in the digital team because we we wanted this to be a really a yeah immersive a, immersive storytelling and and it's some, it's very challenging to to do nice visual presentations for investigations where you don't know what you're going to get in terms of photos or video or anything so that's why we we, we kind of decided let's start from the beginning and, and and go all the way and, and try our best really to illustrate this in the best way and However, the distance yeah. also, I think we oh, yeah. wanted to have what a to do. that showed how, you know, vast this uh, route was, how vast the boat had, had drifted away from, and how really interconnected all these continents are, uh, oh. because of migration, whether they want it or not, you know, they left from West Africa, they were trying to get to Europe, they ended up in the Caribbean, and and this is, you know, the world is small in that sense. And how all of this is linked. Did you at any point feel that you or your sources were in danger? And how did you try to protect your sources? Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. the smugglers were a very real presence in this investigation. Yeah, right? in, in Mauritania, we felt, um, we didn't see or encounter, but we felt that the smugglers were kind of 
coming behind us after us and telling the families that what we were saying wasn't true that everyone was alive they were just in prison in morocco because they had been intercepted by police and and then you know some people that um helped us even though we asked them not to go to authorities because we knew that in mauritania uh authorities are sometimes uh working with smugglers or getting bribed by smugglers and you know um when people did go to the local authorities to ask for help or ask for information they were threatened they were asked not to ask questions they were told off um and so or they were yeah. approached by the smugglers or approached by the smugglers and told you know so told not off, to go not to the authorities to, again so. and not to talk to us yeah. or not to you know help us um and that it was all nonsense um so we did we did feel it and and people did tell us you know they were uh threatened and and we obviously tried to help protect them as much as we could we were as discreet as we could we tried to uh not um gather too much attention and and you know protect our sources to a certain extent as much as we could and um and really you know, the focus was really uh, identifying the the victims um yeah and but... being um let me encourage everyone to please uh send in questions and questions to the chat or raise questions um you know because i have a couple more questions for you guys and then we can open it up to any other questions um what was the impact of this investigation um, when it was all, you know, when it was all done. I mean, I think there are, you know, I, I think probably the most immediate impact was on the families, but also how did it change how this is investigated? Is Has there been further investigation into this and other cases? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I think, that, let's say the, the immediate impact was that we saw, for example, uh, the ICRC that initially had said it wouldn't be able to help some families with the DNA test, then go back and say, okay, we can we can help you actually, and go go back and take more samples and send more samples to Tobago. Uh, and that was very good. Um, the other impact, I think, was just really uh, bring this issue of the Atlantic migration route uh, and all the deaths and disappearances and all these boats that were washing ashore on the other side of the Atlantic uh, to the international stage, I think, a bit more, uh, give more attention to this route because we talk about the Mediterranean a lot, but the Atlantic is so, so deadly and there's so little information about it. And then I think um, this year, for example, we saw, again, another case happen in Brazil, a boat from Mauritania that drifted across the Atlantic and was found in Brazil. And authorities uh, had seen our investigation, had seen our story, and um, used a lot of the uh, lessons learned or the techniques we used and, to our, and are now investigating this case in Brazil and have this as a reference. So that is, um, I think, really beneficial uh, just to have more information about, you know, the fact that these boats are washing ashore on the other side of the Atlantic and um, people know about it and families know about it and authorities know about it. We definitely noticed that every time after we published, as, as Renata said, it was not the first time that it happened, but it was really, there was not a, a single investigation like this before. So mm -hmm. after... After that, uh, every every boat that appeared uh, across the Atlantic, we we would see a, a spike in our. Uh, I think. Oh, I in think, the. Like people were reaching out to us again I and think, asking more. Uh, I think we proved that it's cases like this can be investigated and people can mm. be found. Will be and victims what? can't be identified because a lot of times we see cases like this and they lead to nothing there's no conclusion no one gets identified families are never informed we kind of proved it can be done if people put in the resources yeah, and the right. time to do which it which brings up the question of why do you think this was so ignored um you know why did nobody pay attention to this 
Um, we hear about, you know, boats in the Mediterranean, certainly, but uh, nobody had written about this. Why? I mean, to be fair, to be fair, there had been some stories on the Atlantic route. I'm not saying no one had written about it, but but I think few had investigated this thoroughly and and you know found the families and showed the link and 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 also showed the scope of the problem. We identified just into 2021. Um, I don't remember now if it's seven. six or seven boats that drifted from West Africa to the Caribbean that were trying to get to Spain. So it really is a big issue. And, and this is not counting all the other boats that disappear. Um, Which are in but the, I think, the majority. Yeah. I think that, I mean, the, the lack of interest in solving cases of dead migrants or missing migrants and finding their families and identifying them is a problem um, across the world. But I think uh, in this route that's so disconnected, um, first of all, I think that the, the 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 fact that these are black, usually black people we're talking about from Africa, from West Africa, black men, if they were white, i I think the reaction and the interest in finding out what had happened would have been much <laughs> a think, very different. Yes, I think the reaction would have been different. Um, but I think also, to be fair, um, people in the Caribbean and in Latin America didn't have this context of the migration. They didn't know the migration that was happening from West Africa to Spain. And so I think we're connecting the dots and and kind of giving that context, giving that background. Mm -hmm. Information and we saw that very clearly a few months ago when and when this boat was found in Brazil, and you know both Brazilians. So we were following the local news in Brazil, and the first, um, the first kind of news assumptions. when it came out, assumptions were absolutely wrong, and we mm. of course people were saying, "Oh, these are Haitians." These are Haitians and because like, and you knew that was not because they, they yeah. thought it would, it would be from somewhere nearby, not across the Atlantic. When we saw the boat, we immediately knew that was a Mauritanian boat. But you know, people that are yeah, covering that was not the first and, and local authorities, they would not think that this. And then that's that's where we also saw the. Um, actually, our story was a, was used as evidence that oh, this could be a Mauritanian boat. And then, you know, of course, we know that's the case. But um, turned out that, to be. It, it um, would not be. The, it would not be known. Um, if it, yeah, and like in, in in other cases as well. Yeah. So I'm guessing at the start of this investigation, you had no idea how hard it would be, and no idea that it would take two years. Is that right? And were there points when you just wanted to give up altogether? For sure. I mean, I think I've said this already. In the beginning, I thought I was just going to report on what police find found out. I was just waiting for authorities to, you know. Mm figure out what had happened and I would report on whatever conclusion they they reached. And then we realized that they weren't moving forward, that the investigation had stalled, that, you know, it was good, just going to end there. And, and we decided and other organizations that might could have helped or might have done more weren't also doing anything or not enough. So we decided to, to take it on ourselves and um, we didn't realize we would get as far as we we did. There were also things that happened throughout our reporting, both related and unrelated to the story. For example, there was the war in Ukraine um, that we had to you know pause and report on that as well. And so it, it took much longer than I uh, we had anticipated. But I think in the end, um, the time also helped us get yeah, to the bottom of it a lot of the steps like the dna test that we spoke earlier those are steps that were very important were very important but they took months and and many months that we had to wait for something that we couldn't do much in between so it was very difficult to uh yeah, yeah. And there there are moments yeah. where you progress very rapidly in the investigation and moments where it stalls again and you think you're never going to get the story or that, you know, uh, your sources disappear or go quiet. And then, 
you kind of want to give up and then they come back and then there's more information and all of a sudden this, it speeds up again and you you pick up the pace yeah, and you see more information but it's really a roller coaster of of reporting of emotions of findings of you know everything um so yeah it was really uh yeah. well, to get back to get back to the question i um brought up at the beginning on how i did this without killing my spouse were <laughs> there times where you disagreed and who's who was the good cop here and uh how did that work no the, i'm the good cop He's the I, I, i'm the good cop I'm the... <laughs> so you're both the good cop okay no um <laughs> now yeah there were it was i mean there, of course we disagreed on many times but but i think we have um, very complementary skills and we use that along the way to make this happen uh, but it was it was you know difficult especially as we said many times already in Mauritania, there were times that we had to decide uh, one of us go, the other one sits in the car and, you know, mm -hmm. I'll hide the cameras and pretend I'm uh, uh, going to go buy yeah. fish, you know, like a fish buyer <laughs> to, to, to enter places where I was not allowed to as a journalist. So it was, uh, yeah, and it was challenging, you know, to make those decisions um, no, or or how to approach certain authorities. You know, I yeah. have one way of approaching. He has another way of approaching them. And, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's you know where we kind of disagree. But in general, I think we also really helped each other through these two years because it was really challenging. It was challenging mm -hmm. just in terms of the reporting, in terms of you know emotionally speaking, uh, carrying a story like that for two years is is really. Uh, difficult and especially when you don't know how it's going to turn out and um, yeah. because of all the implications you know the families and, and the answers they're seeking and the answers you're seeking so I think in the end it it worked out um, that we actually you know yeah I think it would be even more challenging 24, <laughs> 24 hours seven days a week uh, investigation so yeah it would be even more challenging we were understanding. <laughs> yeah I think so yeah Okay, well, let me, um, I know the session is being recorded, but if there is anyone live who would like to ask questions or put anything in the chat, uh, it, it, let me just open it up for a minute. Okay, it doesn't look like anyone is uh, is sending in questions. They, they might as people watch the recording, but I'll leave you two to deal with that. So, well, let's tie it up there. Thank you both so much. Oh, well, we do have a question. Uh, did the AP empower you to make those kinds of decisions in the course of the reporting? For example, to at times present yourself not as a journalist. Uh, no. We never, we never did it. You never did that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. never did that. We always presented ourselves as a journalist. What I meant to say before when we approached it in two parts is that we didn't uh, uh, go on the record immediately in the sense of this is not an interview. We're talking yeah. to you. We're journalists. This is what we found. But you don't feel like you have to be part of the story or this is an interview. Um, we'll come back another day to have that discussion. Yeah, but have it actually recorded. Yeah, and I think yeah. you know, I think what I was saying was more and more. Tina, there were places that they didn't want us to enter, and then mm. I, I didn't go with the cameras, and I didn't in, in those places. Oh, I didn't maybe present. the fish buyer. Yeah, the fish buyer. <laughs> Trying to get it. Yeah, to the that, that was that was greatly not, not talking. That was a different situation. It was not that I was not presenting myself as a journalist. It was just that they don't allow. Um, yeah, they actually, don't allow journalists because because of a different problem. There is a a lot of illegal fishing in Mauritania, so mm, okay. highly controlled. That makes sense. But I wanted to go into the port to you know just because that's where they left. So okay. I, I entered several times, uh, not as a journalist, but that was not the case of. Um, it was more of a. I, I I really felt like we needed to go in, uh, and uh, that was the way our fixer. Uh, managed to get us <laughs> but, but, that was, but, that, but like every time as Anna said every time we were yeah, talking to we're people asked, we have right, you would identify asked, yourselves as or, or or when we were caught every time we yeah, present you would say them. um another um, question how much time did you spend reporting in Mauritania and in the Caribbean 
Mauritania was three weeks. One month in Mauritania. One month, one month in Mauritania. Because it's such a huge country. Because we travel across the entire country, it's, basically. Yeah, we um, went from Nwadibu, which is the north uh, west, all the way to the southeast uh, on the border with Mali. And then a couple of weeks in so Spain, that, of course, in yeah. France and, and Tobago. And, and Trinidad Tobago, and Tobago, I think it was like 10 days. Yeah. In Trinidad and Tobago, two weeks, yeah, around ten that. days, two weeks, yeah. Um, yeah. next next question: What role did your fixer or fixers have in your investigation? Um, in in Mauritania is where yeah. we had a fixer. We had a we only use a fixer in Mauritania, uh, and and usually, I, I can say that I work a lot with fixers because I work you know in many different countries where you need to work with fixers and i i have some of them became very very close friends and some of my best friends i met as if as fixers but in mauritania it was a traumatic experience <laughs> they weren't as helpful as, yeah. as we had hoped uh them they would be yeah it was more about logistics and and yeah. um driving around and and getting places rather than the investigation <laughs> rather than itself. journalistic yeah. like they were not they were not they're not the yeah. kind of a fixers that it was more logistics yeah they were not basically used to working with journalists so it was more about <laughs> didn't you require them for the language i mean it, yeah it, oh, yes and no because but, yeah, yeah. Mm. That, they were that's what we're saying there's a lot of different languages that and, and the experience yeah. that we had in Mauritania was so bad of the fixer that we yeah one up, driver abandoned us in the middle of the report yeah so we ended up wow. he didn't work on we, anything that had to do with migration and then for the wow. language for the language um the the fixer was uh Hassania speaking Arabic speaking but the communities we were visiting spoke uh, Fulani and um, mm -hmm. Sonanke. And so we had other local so we, interpreters we ended working up, with us. We to, ended up to, yeah. locating basically what we what we realized was better in this particular situation was we located uh, in every city that we needed um, locals that could work with us just as translators. Um, because, you know, from French to whatever was the the local uh, language. And they were, so that was much better than the fixer. But that was a very specific case in Mauritania because as I said, this is not usually the case of fixers. Um, yeah. Yeah, that we usually rely on them. Immensely. Usually, yeah, usually. usually they play a much more important role. Yeah, than, this specific yeah. case was, was very difficult. Yeah. too. Um, okay, well, it looks like we don't have any more questions on the chat. So why don't we wrap it up here? Thank you both very much for joining us. And thank you both also for the amazing amount of assistance that you put into this investigation. I mean, uh, some of the methods you used were really difficult and took a lot of creativity. So a huge thank you for that. Um, and thank you all for being here. Okay, bye all. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Bye, Thank bye. You. bye bye.